Church and all our viewers around the world. Thank you for joining me for our midweek Bible study. It's always a joy and a delight to bring this to you. I get to study the Word in a little bit more depth so that we can bring you a significant, uh, meaningful Word. We try to make these uh, midweek Bible studies a little more chewy, uh, try to put some meat out there so that the hearers can uh, go a bit deeper knowing the Scriptures and understanding a little bit more God's intent for the church and for us as born-again believers. So what we want, the takeaway from this is not just knowledge. We want you as a hearer to, to search the scriptures. You know, the Bible says uh, that those of uh, the Bereans and those of Thessalonica were more honorable because they searched the scriptures. It's important for you as a person to search the scriptures, know your Bible, understand all of the... Uh, as many of the covenants and the many things that have been promised unto us uh, by God. And so in the last number of weeks, we've been dealing with judgments. Uh, two weeks ago, we finished with the judgments of the throne of David. Last week, we started the judgment seat of Christ. So this teaching is the judgment seat of Christ, part two. Part one was introductory, just introducing some of the overtones of what the Apostle Paul was saying to the Corinthian church. Uh, acknowledging the fact that these men and women were in horrendous persecution, horrendous persecution. And so he was telling them, you know, you're giving your lives, you, you're dying for Christ's sake, but there is a reward system uh, after we are saved, after we, we go into heaven. And the, he was explaining to the church what that reward system is. And so we'll start with the scripture reading from 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 15. And uh, he's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 15, uh, verse 11 rather, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus built on the foundation of the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. And that foundation, he built his ministry. The church which the apostles are building on is the foundation of Jesus Christ. So you have the first foundation and then it is buttressed, it is embellished, it is enhanced by the foundation of Jesus Christ who is the word. The church is built on that foundation. It's solid. And then he says, now if any man build on this foundation, this is the foundation of Christ, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, Hey, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Anything you do for Jesus, whatever you're doing for Christ, is going to be made manifest. There are people in this church, for example, we'll never ever get to know them. But there are men and women, particularly women, who spend per day hours and hours laboring in deep prayer, laboring for this pulpit to be free, to be liberated, so that the word of God can be uh, dispensed uh, without being chained, with, without being limited. We'll never get to know these people. We, 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 we know they are there, but individuals like that could be labors of love that are gold ministries. Not every pulpit ministry, if any, would be a work of gold. And so sometimes we, we try to judge a thing by what we see with our eyes, not by what is needed by the Spirit. And so again, uh, don't take for granted that a person that is behind the pulpit is gold, silver, precious stones, and that you that's not behind the pulpit, you're not gold, uh, silver, or precious stones, and therefore you want to uh, pursue a pulpit ministry because you want gold, silver, and precious stones. It might, uh, people behind pulpits may not even, their work might be wood, hay, and stubble, which will go into defining certain things later. And so every man's work shall be made manifest, verse 13, for the day, which is the judgment seat of Christ, shall declare it, because that work will be revealed by fire, which is God's fire. The fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. 
If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, that person will receive a reward. And if any man's work shall be burnt by that fire, that person uh, will suffer loss in terms of the reward. However, the individual will be saved. Will be saved. The fire will not consume their salvation. And so we are saved by faith. It is the grace of God that has saved us, that is by faith, the Bible says. So when you accept Jesus as a savior, as your personal savior, he comes into your life, you are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit, you begin to live a righteous life, you fulfill the, uh, the, the judgments of Christ, which is chapter number six of Hebrews, uh, which are the six doctrines of Christ, rather, you fulfill those, you're walking in the faith. It is important for you then to work for Christ, to serve. And there are so many things that you can do that enrich the uh, ministry of the church through what we do for Christ. So the Apostle Paul is telling these Corinthian people that uh, you might be giving your life, you might be dying uh, because of persecution, but remember there's a reward system. So the first one is gold, silver, precious stones. No matter how intense the fire is, whether it's physical fire or God's fire, no matter how intense the fire is, those three entities only get better with fire. Wood, hay, stubble, fire consumes that and burns that. And you can see that, for example, in the making and the creation of the tabernacle. All the works of gold and silver the works of iron and brass, all of those were works that were works of a furnace. And so wood, hay, and stubble were needed to start the fire. And so wood, hay, and stubble, stubble are important. They are fire starters. But if you have wood, hay, and stubble, if you start a fire, a fire doesn't last forever. A fire has to be fueled. So you need more wood, more wood, more wood. And so it's not like wood, hay, and stubble people are unnecessary. No, we need wood, hay, and stubble people to keep the fire going, to keep the revival going, to keep the church going. You need those people. But those works don't come into great eternal rewards. And so the Bible says every man's work will be judged, will be revealed, will be tested by fire. So I did a study of fire in preparing for this and went through just about every scripture in the Bible that has to do with fire, which is God's fire. And so the first one you will find is in Genesis chapter number four, where Cain and Abel bring their sacrifice to the Lord. And Abel's sacrifice was more excellent, it was accepted, and Cain's was rejected. And so we know that because uh, God would accept an offering, and the way we knew an offering was accepted is because God would send fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. You see this in First, uh, uh, first Kings chapter number 17, with Elijah saying, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And so way back, before there was a requirement for sacrifices to be made, when men made sacrifices to, to see if God approved of their walk and their life, the way they knew that God approved, fire would come from heaven and would consume that sacrifice. And so the first fire we see is Abel's sacrifice that is implied as opposed to said. The next time you'll see God's fire is in Genesis chapter number 15 and verse 17. When God cuts a covenant with Abraham, Abraham is put to sleep in that chapter. And the Bible says that God cuts the covenant, a furnace and a smoking flax move between the pieces of the sacrifices that are there. There were five animals that were put on that altar. Five is the number of grace. So Abraham was being given grace. But five was also releasing in Abraham 
the fivefold ministry that was in him to be birthed in the earth at some point. And so because Abraham's fire would be limited, would have to be fueled, and you'll see this later in the similar chapter, Abraham's fire would have to be fueled by wood, hay, and stubble. God didn't need this covenant to be fueled by wood, hay, and stubble all the way until Jesus came. God sent his fire to secure that eternal and earthly contract into eternity. The next time you will see God's fire is in Genesis chapter 19, verse 44, where God rained fire from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah. And so two angels with God come and meet Abraham. Abraham gives them something to eat in Genesis 18. They then start walking towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And God then says, I can't hide this from Abraham and shares with Abraham, I'm going to destroy the cities. And Abraham says, can you destroy the cities if there's 50 righteous and came all the way down to 10? God said, if there's 10, I'll spare the cities uh, for the, the sake of 10 righteous. They couldn't find 10 righteous people. And so God went his way. The two angels went into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. God locked his wife and the two girls, their, their husbands refused to come. They went out into the plains of Zor, into the mountains, and the Bible says God's fire came and consumed those cities. The next time you will see God's fire is in chapter number uh, 22, verse 6 through 7 of the book of Genesis. You will see significant fire there. And so Abraham and Isaac are going up to the mountain because God wanted Abraham to sacrifice his only son, which was Isaac, the covenant son. And so Isaac says to his father, you have the wood, you have the fire, the flame, where's the sacrifice? And so the fire is important for the sacrifice. In chapter number 3 and verse 2 of the book of Exodus, when Moses is in the wilderness, Moses sees a bush that is on fire. It was the fire of God that was on a, a physical, uh, perishable element, a simple bush, but the fire of God which came on that bush for the purpose of God the purpose of God will not consume a perishable in the earth. So when God puts his fire on you, uh, you are a limited perishable being. You will not be consumed. God's fire will quicken and, and uh, make you whole. And so when Moses turned aside to see this wonder of a fire on a bush, but the bush was not consumed, he turned aside and God spoke to, Ab uh, to Moses out of that fire. The next time you'll see God's fire is in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, verse 22, and verse 23, where God put a pillar of fire at night to lead the children of Israel through the wilderness. And that pillar of fire is seen throughout the journeys of the children of Israel in the 40 years they were in the wilderness. That pillar of fire could be seen. It was a giant, giant street light. So it was also a giant heater to warm them in the treacherous cold uh, temperatures of the desert, the cloud in the treacherous uh, heat of the desert. So the temperature range in the day, it could be as high as 40, 45 degrees Celsius. And at night, it could dip to zero, minus zero. And so God was then giving them air conditioning so that their journey into the promise could be comfortable. God will always give you comforts in leading you into gaining your promise and rewards of his covenants. And then Leviticus chapter number 1, verse 7 through 8, is the priests Aaron and his son's censers, where they would offer incense in their censers. That was the fire of God that was given. That fire was where God came down, ignited the sacrifice when Moses built the tabernacle. That fire was never to go out. 
So wherever the children of Israel went in the wilderness, a priest was responsible to make sure that that fire never went out. It was that initial fire that was on the altar for the sacrifice. It was that fire that was used to light the candlesticks in the holy, in the holy place, the seven candlesticks. That fire was never to go out. There must always be a custodian in the church, a custodian in your family. You as a custodian, as a person where the fire never goes out in your life. Never go out in your life. The next time you'll see this fire is in uh, when Joshua uh, went to Jericho. They were given an instruction. You must burn the city of Jericho with fire. Everything in the city must be burnt with fire. Every house, every habitation, every animal, everything that's there, every person that's in there must be destroyed. And everything must be burnt with fire because Jericho is the tithe. The Bible calls Jericho the devoted thing. The word devoted is set apart. Set apart is the tithe. So Jericho was the tithe for what's coming. In other words, if you believe me for the promised land, uh, whatever you see in Jericho, if you give that to me first, everything else is yours freely. You have to have faith that I'll give you the rest. And so Achan didn't have faith. So he took a Babylonian garment, he took some wages of gold and silver, and so... He had to be killed. And the reason he was killed, because Achan wanted his now. He couldn't walk by faith. He wanted to walk by sight. And anything that is not of faith, the Bible says, is sin. And so fire then leveled that whole field. Because fire is the equalizer. You'll see fire used in uh, Judges 6, verse 21. And also in chapter 7, verse 20. In dealing with Gideon, where Gideon was offering, uh, his, he was threshing wheat in a wine press, and the angel of the Lord called him a great man. And Gideon couldn't believe he was great. And so a long story short, Gideon then took his father's bullock and offered it as a sacrifice. And the angel of the Lord, which is God himself, put fire on that altar and consumed the sacrifice. As a deliverer, God's going to Put, put fire on every sacrifice you make, whether it's a dollar offering, a $10,000 offering. We had a guest speaker uh, a few weeks ago from Cape Town, Pastor Winnie McDonald, and she said something in a presentation that I'd never heard before. We don't give in equal measures. We give in equal sacrifice. That was life-changing because a person that is giving a dollar, that's everything, might be a greater sacrifice than someone who's giving $10,000 who has $10 million. So it's not equal measure. It has to be equal sacrifice. And I love that very much. And so uh, you might be bringing your sacrifice, whatever it is. The fire of God is the equalizer. It's the fire of God that accepts your sacrifice, empowers your sacrifice, and empowers your future. Uh, number nine of this list, uh, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 24 through 25, and also uh, in chapter 18, verse 38, where Elijah said, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And so the false prophets of Baal, 450 of them were dancing and cutting themselves on the mount called Mount Carmel, Elijah just relaxed the whole day, but when it came to evening, he then took a bullock, built the altar, took a bullock, cut it in pieces, put water, 12 barrels of water on the altar, a barrel for each tribe. It's the washing of water by the word on the altar. Prayed a simple prayer, a handful of words. The fire of God came from heaven and swallowed up that offering. And all the people bowed down and let God be God. And then Elijah then killed all the prophets of Baal. Because once God answers by fire, you can't let the things live that have put you back. There are things that 
I mean, God will take your sacrifice. But you have to go back and kill all the false prophets of poverty, all the false prophets of ignorance, all the false prophets uh, of filth and dirt and so on. Uh, God will take your sacrifice and answer by fire, but there's things that you as a person that you have to kill. And with your prophetic anointing, which is the sword of God in your mouth, there's things you have to kill and you have to destroy. I need an amen from everybody out there. Number 10, uh, e Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 11. The enemy had come in and surrounded Elisha. He didn't panic. His servant was panicking. Elisha prayed the prayer and he said, uh, God, open my servant's eyes. And when his servant's eyes were opened, he saw all around them chariots of fire. These are uh, an angelic branch of the heavens, the warring branch who war with the fire of God. And so they are always around us. The fire of God is invisible. When it's need to, when it's need to be visible, God will open your eyes to see that. Number 12. First Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 26. A plague had come into Israel because David began to raise up an army and number the army. He wanted to know how many troops he had. And God was offended by that because all of David's life, he walked by faith knowing that the Lord is my, my shield, the Lord is my buckler, the Lord is my strong man, the Lord is my fortress. The Lord is fighting on my behalf. And David, when he began to count the number of soldiers, he was then beginning to lean on the arm of flesh. And the Bible is clear. Cursed is the man or the woman who leans on the arm of flesh. And because David wanted to number his soldiers and say, ah, we'll win this battle because we have more troops than they have, God said, I'm offended by that. You have leaned on the arm of flesh. You have not walked by faith and trusted in me. There are three things coming. Three and a half years of famine. Uh, you'll be running from your enemy for six months or three days of plague in, in Jerusalem and in Israel. And David said, I'm too old to be running around the world. Uh, I'm, I, I've been through a famine before. It will destroy our economy. It will destroy the gains we have made. No famine. I'm an old man now. I don't want to be in the wilderness running away from place to place, hiding in caves in a tent here, da, 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 trying to find food. He said, I'll take the three-day plague. And an angel was unleashed and killed 70,000 people. And to stop the plague, David went to Onan's threshing floor on Mount Zion. The threshing floor of wheat is where it is potential. Wheat is potential revelation knowledge. Is revelation knowledge in seed form. The threshing floor brings revelation knowledge in seed form. It has to be broken. All the revelation in seed form have to lose their individual identity and made flower. That flower then has to be kneaded with a K, K-N-E-A-D, kneaded uh, and made into a dough. That dough has to be put into the oven and baked. Once the bread is baked, it can never go back to an individual wheat kernel so it can claim its individual contribution. As a judge, every person comes as a weed kernel. And if every person wants individual identity, we won't be a church. So we all bring our wheat together. We all get our wheat crushed. We all make flour and we create one loaf. This church is one loaf. The body of Christ, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. It's one loaf. When he served communion, he broke the bread and he broke the bread for communion from one loaf. We are one body, one loaf. And so for this act year, when David got Onan's threshing floor, and he built an altar there as a sacrifice, Onan and said, just take it. And David said, I cannot give anything to God that will not cost me. This has to cost me. I have to pay a price for what I brought on the nation for the last three days. I have to pay a price for the widows I have created. I have to pay a price for the children that be, will be raised without, and father, without a father. And he took out of his personal income, his personal 
not the national treasury, from his personal income and paid Onan the price per square meter of that. Because the second thing is, if he didn't pay for it, Onan would have owned that altar place and David would have to come and rent it another time. But he paid the price once. If you pay the price once, and you paid hard, and you paid with gold, you paid with your blood, you paid with sacrifice, where you paid the price, you will own forever. And that's the place, historically, on Mount Zion, where on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, the cloven tongues of fire that David initiated at Onan's threshing floor, that fire repeated on 120 heads. 120 is 12 multiplied by 10. 12 is the foundation. 10 is the Ten Commandments. All in the upper room, men and women, the power of God fell there in God's fire. Uh, two more or four more, you'll see God's fire in Ezekiel chapter number 1 verse 13 and 27 where God's fire came to Ezekiel. You'll see God's fire in Daniel chapter number 3, 22, chapter 3, verse 24, chapter 3, verse 25, chapter 3, verse 26, where Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were in Nebuchadnezzar's fire. And so before they got into Nebuchadnezzar's fire, Nebuchadnezzar's fire could melt gold. And so these men refused to bow down. And so Nebuchadnezzar then made the fire seven times hotter. What he didn't realize he was raising the temperature to God's fire. And they took these three boys and put them in the fire. That fire refined them as a gold ministry. As a gold ministry. So much so that throughout the entire Babylon, their God was made the only God that all of the Babylonians could serve. And then you'll see God's fire on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 3, when they were one place in one accord, and they appeared on each of them cloven tongues as of fire, and they all begin to speak with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And then uh, God's fire is seen in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13 through 15, which is the judgment seat of Christ, where God's fire is coming to test our work to see if what we have done for Christ will last, to see if what we have done for Christ is meaningful, to see if what sacrifice we have made with God shifts the needle on, on influence as to where we're going. And then lastly, Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 29, a very, very powerful scripture on which all of these other examples we gave hang. Our God... God is a consuming fire. So when fire comes in your life, if it's demonic fire, you will survive. If it's God's fire, it's to make you better. It's to burn off all the chaff. It's to burn off all the wood, the hay, the stubble, the meaningless things in your life. But it's to purify your voice, your gift, your anointing, your contribution, to purify your sacrifice. And so when God sends you fire, it's not to destroy you, Job. It's to get you ready for the double that I intend to give you. In the beginning, when that fire comes, it's to make you better for what's coming in your life. Every single person who is ready or is being cued for, who is being lined up for reward in your life, reward is preceded by fire. Because you can't have a weak foundation for a massive blessing. The blessing cannot be greater than the foundation. If the blessing is greater than the foundation, the blessing will be lost. If the fruit on a tree is bigger than the tree, it will destroy the fruit and the tree. So the tree has to be bigger than the fruit. Your reward uh, is going to be big, but the foundation has to be bigger than what God is going to give you. And so, sisters and brothers, what we do for Christ will last. It's needful we work for him. It's needful we do the things that have to be done, but always keep in the back of your mind. 
Is this a gold, silver, precious stone work? If it's a wood, hay stubble, Heavenly Father, please let my, my wood be perfected. All diamonds, all diamonds are carbon-based, which simply means that before the diamond, it could have been anthracite uh, or uh, bitumous coal, uh, which is carbon. Uh, before that, that coal was a tree. Before that tree was a seed. And so the wood that you're using to empower your life is carbon-based. So ask God, take my wood and make it a precious stone. The minute you ask him that, you are going to exert God's going to exert pressure and heat to turn wood into a diamond. Guys, it's great being with you this evening. God bless you. Let your work be gold, silver, and precious stone. Remember, the judgment seat of Christ is the, it's the doctrine and the judgment of rewards. Great is your reward. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for tuning with us. We'll see you next time.